your blank mind right <laughs> Hello. Uh, welcome to Us in Flux Conversations from the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona University. Thanks for being with us. My name is Joey Eshrick, and I'm the editor and program manager for the center, uh, where we use the tools of speculative fiction to get people thinking about our future in ways that are inclusive, imaginative, and inspiring. And Us in Flux is one of our responses to these strange and trying times. Uh, every week we short a story that explores themes of community, collaboration, and collective imagination in to transformative events. Uh, we then host a public conversation like one of these to uh, go even deeper on those topics. And uh, I'm very glad to have with me today uh, Kids Johnson, Jesse Rack, and I'm going to go about introducing them right now. So uh, our second story was published uh, last Thursday. Uh, it's titled An Attempt at Exhausting My Deck, and it's by uh, Kids Johnson, who's here with us. It's an absolutely lovely piece about backyard ecology, feces, communities, and how to be alone without being lonely. And uh, Kidge is a, a friend of ours and an incredible speculative fiction author, won, uh, among others, the Hugo, Nebula, and World Fantasy Awards. Uh, she teaches at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, where she's also the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Science Fiction. And uh, we're really delighted to have her as part of this series and to have her with us. Uh, we're also joined by the RAC, Program Coordinator for the Supporting Environmental Education and Communities Program at the University of Arizona. Jessie holds a PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from the University of Connecticut, and she's done some great writing um, recently for us through the Center's Imaginary Papers newsletter. Uh, and she wrote an essay last week about the 2005 horror film, The Descent, which everybody should check out. Yeah. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, uh, let's jump right into the conversation. Cool. Uh, I should say actually though, one further ado, uh, you can ask questions uh, throughout the conversation and we're gonna have uh, a period for Q&A at the end. So uh, use the Q&A button in your Zoom and you can drop us a question and I will direct it to Kidge and Jesse when the time comes. So uh, don't be shy about sending those in anytime. So Kidge, could you just start by uh, telling us a little bit more about the story and what inspired it? Sure, um, I brought a visual aid. Um, the story was inspired by a book by a French writer, Georges Perec, um, called An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris, which was him spending three days uh, logging everything he saw. And he started by saying, I'm not gonna log the fountain or the big glamour stuff. I'm gonna log the people walking by. And that's what he does for three days. And that got me thinking when I first moved to the house I, uh, I'm living in now, I had a deck in the back and it got me to thinking about uh, what, what happens if you stay in place in a single place for a very extended period of time. And so for a couple of weeks, I would sit down for a couple of hours a day and I would just log everything I saw. I learned a huge amount. And then the story came from that. The story came from the idea of what happens when I stared out the window. What did I learn? What did I like? And that I ended up writing this story about a character who um, just stares out her window a lot and starts to realize things, starts to see things she didn't see the first or the 10th time. So Jesse, just to, I guess, kick us off, like how, how does that connect to your work? So I know you do, you do a lot of work uh, with uh, community folks and with, and with young people around uh, connections between humans and the environment. So I'm interested to hear uh, how this story struck you. Yeah, oh yeah, and actually, um, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure when you first invited me to be a part of this conversation, how I fit in. And then I read Kidge's story and was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is what I do, this is science. and I. Didn't, and actually, I'd like to ask you all, like, did you intend this to be scientific? Like, is that, was that your, your sort of goal, Kish? I or love that question. This is even better. <laughs> no, that's enough. I love that question. It kind yeah. of was because I'm an enormous fan of natural history and natural philosophy, mm -hmm. which is the old school, you know, history and observational science, uh, watching how ravens eat or watching how, you know, uh, squirrels interact, that's, that's such an enormous part of natural science. Right. But we really didn't have a good way to, 
do it except watch. I mean, now there's all kinds of interesting things happening because now if somebody says, I saw interspecies uh, collaboration between a cheetah and you know, a, a hyena, now they have a YouTube video, which right. we have not. But for a long time, all, the only people who got this were people who went out in the middle of nowhere and then they just sat and watched and watched and took notes. And maybe people believed them and maybe people thought it was just anecdotal, but yeah. observational science is to my mind, the really fun kind because it requires yeah. so much from you, but it's also, it's visible and it's, um, it's there. Yeah. Um, I love that. It's us just seeing stuff. I love, yeah, that, that really filled me in actually. And to, to circle back to Joey's question also, that was, um, that's sort of how I see science also, or at least the very foundations of it. Um, and so as an environmental educator, I work with kids sort of fourth grade through 12th grade. And one of the very first things I do with them is I have an observational lesson like this. Um, to my mind, it's because I, I teach the scientific method, you know, but to my mind, the scientific method itself is just the way it's taught and the way it's kind of structured, like first this and then that and then that turns a lot of people off and makes them think of it as something separate from what we naturally are already engaging in, whether you see yourself as a scientist or not, right? So one of the first things I do with kids before I'm even like, let's do science, is I take them outside and I just have them sit there and write down everything they see and everything they hear and everything they notice. And so they have two goals on that first, um, on that first lesson, which is what reminded me of your story, which is write down what you notice. Um, so you have to write a sentence that starts with I notice and you have to write a sentence that starts with I wonder. So, and in the- That's it, that's the scientific method. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but in the process of your narrative, I know that's exactly it. And in the process of your narrative, um, that's the way is it starts with these, with these, um, observations and then your your character sort of builds into these questions yeah so i like that i secretly teach the scientific method through this. yeah well and it's and it's also so it's like you see the thing and i love that idea of you know i noticed this and i yeah. do a similar exercise when i'm teaching creative writing sometimes where i'm like uh you're going to look at this photograph usually something like a bridge you're going to describe everything you can see in that bridge take as yeah. long as you need take take forever Come back a week later, now you're going to describe everything you didn't notice the first time. And, mm -hmm. and it's so much better in a three-dimensional environment, like, like outside or something, than a photograph. Um, but once they start doing that, and then they, they do start asking questions, and then they start answering them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we've, if we've shown them how to use the internet properly, then we're like, I mean, in the story, Lina... Um, starts asking questions about all kinds of stuff, like what's the difference between all these little brown birds? Um, not even birders can tell the difference between all the little brown birds. But I know I spent a very entertaining two weeks drawing little diagrams saying, okay, so an Asiatic sparrow has stripes like this, mm. a European sparrow has stripes, oh no, that didn't help. So I just kept trying stuff and then I kept reading and I kept noticing, you know, so I'd read somebody say the beak is a different shape and I go, oh, is the beak a different shape? And like, <laughs> well, I can't tell, but maybe it is. Yeah. And finally, it's like some of these things I never have been able to answer. Um, yeah. Some of these things I kind of do, I can tell at least some basic differences and what's fun is the way we combine the observation and then we have the question and then we try to answer the question with the existing information out there and then when we can't we're observing again we just keep looking and sooner or later we come up with answers that may be wrong because goodness knows old natural science old you know um, one of my favorite natural history writers, this guy Gilbert White, who was writing in the 18th century, was convinced that swifts collected in a ball in the fall and they dropped to the bottom of a lake and that's mm -hmm. where they would winter. He was absolutely convinced. <laughs> we look at that, we're like, you have no possible proof that that's what happened. <laughs> but he was doing the best he could with the information he had and that was as legitimate as anything else he could think of. And I think that's really fun too is when we go down false trails because we don't have all the answers. There is somebody out there who does, but I don't have all the answers. Lina doesn't know the difference between sparrows. Yeah. Um, maybe someday one of us will figure it out. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I love that you're describing the whole process and everything you're saying is what I say about science and what I say about teaching science, right? So it's all the process of gradually learning what you can with what you know and coming to a conclusion and testing it. And if you're wrong, well, I guess you're going to circle back and try again and add more information to what you know. That's the whole process. And yeah. I love your character and that you, in your explanation, have gone through that process. Um, and you can even see it in the story as you read it, as Lena kind of starts at the beginning being like, oh, look at that squirrel, that's weird, you know, and just, just <laughs> and then the details build up and she starts to understand more. And you can see it even in that very short space of the story, how she slowly like becomes more knowledgeable and she's able to draw larger conclusions and she starts to see everything as parts of an integrated whole. And I thought mm -hmm. it was very effective how that happened. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. that was a lot of fun. So <laughs> yeah. one thing that I wanted to kind of, uh, one thing I wanted to interject here is, you know, the way that we uh, at our center often think about science fiction is that it can sensitize people to these, you know, broader issues, uh, you know, whether they're issues of inequality or whether they're issues of these like big techno social systems that people maybe have a hard time seeing outside of. Um, that's, that speculative fiction and fiction in general has this, you know, power to help us see, see those systems. And it, it strikes me that, um, you know, this story comes at a moment of climate crisis, and it's a it's a it's a it's a small story. It doesn't it doesn't blow out to that global picture, but it's about this backyard naturalism or this backyard ecology that anybody can do, and the way that it can like sensitize us to our embeddedness as a species with the natural world. Um, and I wonder what you all thought about that, and and Jesse as an educator, how you think about like kind of that micro to macro perspective, and whether that's you know. A, a, mm -hmm. a, a strategy that you're uh, using or one that, that is not really part of it? Oh yeah, that's a great question. And exactly, you nailed it. I love the embeddedness. I love that you used that word. Um, yeah. Because my whole, my program, I'm part of the school garden program at the University of Arizona. And so what I do is I use school gardens and outdoor spaces to do environmental education. And so by doing that, I hope to show my students that sort of this microcosm of the whole world is right there, wherever you are. You know, we can, teach, I could teach you about rainforests and about ecosystems and about um, ecology and interconnectedness, but I could also just take you outside and show you on a small scale and help you understand that that's just like a small part, but we are all part of it and everything's interconnected. So that's, that's very much, a, it's a very good entry point into those bigger issues, which I also thought was, um, was something effective about this story too. That's, that's amazing because, um, because I was about to push back on Joey and say, well, mm -hmm. I think um, backyard nature is about global climate. Mm -hmm. Um, every form of engagement with the natural world has an implication that's so much broader. And it's true that um, in fiction, we talk a lot about how your first sentence, you're only one sentence into a story and your reader only knows one sentence's worth of what you're trying to tell them. So um, when you're writing science fiction, Joey, uh, a lot of times you have to find these ways that you're giving the reader enough information they want to stay with that sentence. And then you give them more information and more. And so this sort of access point, how we get into mm -hmm. a story is the same way as how we get into thinking about climate change or something. There, there has to be a pinpoint that you point to and you say, I'm concerned about that clump of trees, or I'm concerned about that bird, or I'm yeah. concerned about the monarch butterflies, because I live on a monarch um, flight path. And I'm concerned about the monarch butterflies. And then all of a sudden, I'm concerned about the habitat, the local habitat. And then all of a sudden, I'm concerned about Mexican habitat. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I'm concerned about all the other butterflies because they're not monarchs. So we start from any point, And if it, if it fires us up, it becomes an access point that allows us to just keep going deeper and broader. And if I, if I do my work right as a human being, um, that single monarch will get me started down a path that could go on for decades and could change a lot of things. So we're, and even in cities, because of course, um, so many of us live in cities now and our nature is sort of compartmentalized and it's sort of, um, we don't think we're going to see a rainforest, but we can in fact see canopies in the ways that they've planted the plants downtown. We can see the two layers or the three layers of life that are forming based on whether it's down in the dirt or whether it's up high in the tree and how they interact. And it gets really kind of fun 
to try to look at these micro examples. I love the idea of blowing it out and saying, or I could just show you, here's how, this isn't a rainforest, but this is how a rainforest would work now that you're holding these branches or these leaves in your hands. Yeah, and I think that idea of an entry point too, or the anchor point, that's very important in terms of, I'm gonna step out of my field for a second, but my understanding of human psychology, right? It's hard for us to grasp these big, kind of um, amorphous ideas of like, oh, climate change, the environment. Right. If we have something to something close by, close by our homes and ourselves that we can kind of connect to and mm -hmm. say, oh, this is happening in my backyard. Oh, I noticed this. And it yeah. can, can open you up to the broader ideas and broader concepts of what's going on. Yeah, that's, and that's a wonderful, uh, and it can be anything, but it does require that you just look around. I mean, uh, it could be milkweed pods because I just noticed those. I'd never seen them in this neighborhood before, but, but of course we have milkweed pods. We have butterflies. So you have to have milkweed. So that, and things just kind of expand outwards. And if every single one of us cared deeply enough about one part of this world, then we would, that would be plenty. We would we would be all connecting ultimately. Yeah, we have another project that uh, gets into climate justice a bit. And one of the things that I learned quite a bit about in reading background on that was the idea of stewardship and uh, that, you know, for example, in South Asia, like forest dwelling, traditionally forest dwelling communities that have been on their land for, for many, many generations uh, practice these really intensive forms of stewardship. And now as we shift to a more globalized world where they have less control over their uh, local environments have have you know taken that stewardship and translated it into uh, activism and, and uh, uh, at the national and transnational scale, uh, acting as kind of protectors of these you know globally speaking pretty small areas of land, but that of course as you two were talking about subject to the same destructive or disruptive processes that we're seeing mm -hmm. uh, globally and uh, you know like the UN and other organizations that do research show that ecosystems that are protected in this way and stewarded by these human communities are actually sometimes healthier than ones that are, you know, undisturbed or, or, or uh, you know, that might be, be considered pure by some uh, environmental thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, so that actually bridges to something else I wanted to ask about, which is, is community, which is the, at the heart of this series. Uh, that was, is one of our sort of key themes. Um, how do both of you think community comes into the story and like what might it have to tell us about what it means to be part of a community? I, I guess um, when I first heard about this project, um, I thought, but I don't have anything to say about community. Um, <laughs> because um, as I was thinking about this, I live alone and I have a cat who's raising hell somewhere in the house. But, um, but I, my friends are all over the world, mostly not local. Um, most of, and mostly, um, and I'm an introvert, so I like my solitude quite a lot. Um, and I thought, I don't really think, I don't feel a need for more community than I have. And then I, and that's what got me thinking, but that's because I have community. I do have connections and they're not the connections that perhaps I was raised to believe were the ones you should prioritize. You know, I don't have a partner, I don't have children, I don't have, you know, best friends that I play poker with every Thursday at the moment. Um, but I do have um, all of these other connections and I value them sometimes as much. I would actually grieve leaving all of my little woodland community out on the deck. And when I moved from the last house, I did. I painstakingly worked out a feeding strategy to taper everybody off in a way that wouldn't be too traumatic. Um, and even so, I won't go back by that neighborhood because you, the people who are there, the little animals, they are the children and the people I used to know. And um, I just don't want to do that. So the story ended up me, with me thinking about the ways community happens even when you appear to be alone and that there's something wrong with uh, um, feeling to value these communities that are not those sort of socially um, normed ones. And we're pretty good at that in the world right now that we're starting to accept, you know, that sometimes your family is not the people who raised you. Sometimes your family are the people who get you. Um, 
But there's still even farther we can go and say, sometimes the people who matter to you are, are not people that you even know, um, not in a creepy stalker way, but sometimes what matters is that you care, not that you mutually care. Yeah, that's great. I love that you, and you and both you and the character in the story kind of awaken to this community of everything that's around you, like the natural community. Um, as an ecologist, the first thing I think of when someone says community is not about people at all, which for, for <laughs> excellent is I think of a biological community. Um, uh -huh. Quickly, just to define like the biological definition of community just means all the different interacting species in a particular place. So it can't be just one species in a place. That's a population that's different. <laughs> and I, so love to that. Me, I know. And so to me, it's just so obvious. I'm like, yes, of course, your community is your outside your backyard. And I love that that this practice of going out on, on the character going out on the, her porch and Kind of becoming aware of the community that she's already a part of is this kind of an awakening into the biological definition of community. For me, it was like a very, that's a very nice connection. I love that we got yeah, it. That's, that's, that's super so cool. cool. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't thought of it, but you're right. You know, we tend to think um, as people, we think of populations. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, and we do that even when we apply it to the natural world. So we're like, well, here's what's happening to the red tail hawks, we say. Yeah. It's like nothing but is nothing. happening to red tail hawks. It isn't happening to everything else that the red ta tail hawks are anywhere near. Yeah, nothing happens in isolation ever. So yeah, and that's yeah. true for you know people, and that's true for you know um, like the first time I watched the squirrels all take an alert from a blue jay cry was so eye opening for me because. I knew that they heard each other. I knew that they interacted in very limited ways. They tended to ignore each other or treat each other like pieces of wood that were getting in the way. But that moment that it meant that the squirrels were fully aware of what the, the what I call the air raid siren is. Mm -hmm. um, and when they heard the air raid siren, they acted the way they would if mm -hmm. one of them had given the air raid. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting to think about and then to think, as I kept going, and Lina has this, this insight partway through, um, that, that actually um, she's really been prioritizing all the animals, the, the, the um, attract the charismatic fauna, mm -hmm. um, but she hasn't been thinking much about the wasps or the flies or the bees. Yeah. And when I did the, the deck thing, by day four, I was hyper aware of wasps mm -hmm. because wasps. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I also realized that wasps and flies, I'd been completely ignoring them in my quest for the charisma, for the, the charming animals. Yeah. And so it's, that's part of it too, is starting to recognize that, that even the things that we don't focus on are, are part of that community, which is true in the human world as well. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I see somebody drop something off at my front door, I think about that. I never paid attention to my delivery guys mm -hmm. yeah. months ago, and now I am so aware of them. No, yeah. I, that, that's a really good point. You just lit up all these connections in my head, but you know, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, awakening in the you know mass mainstream version of the environmental movement towards like these non charismatic species we're talking a lot more about pollinators now you see it in mm -hmm. news media that you know not just bees which I think people you know they're the more cartoony uh, insect that we that we think about but all kinds of uh, different kinds of pollinating uh, creatures that play these uh, uh, less glamorous roles in ecosystems and maybe mm -hmm. you know getting us out of just uh, using uh, the polar bear or something as a stand-in for environmental uh, consciousness um, right. and then the same hand that analogy of, of, of folks you know our, our supply chain workers who are uh, I think were mm -hmm. completely in, made invisible by especially by the app economy uh, and are now like you know hyper visible in, 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 in all these different ways and hopefully we'll be served better by policy because of it. Yeah. And I, I noticed too, when you all were both listing off um, components of the, the ecological community that we don't notice, you still only mentioned animals. Yeah. That's true. And I'm hyper, yeah. aware, of, I'm hyper aware of the trees out there um, yeah. because I have Japanese hemlock, which is an invasive species, which mm -hmm. believe me, I didn't know about six months ago. So mm -hmm. um, the more we, yeah, we, we, and just even things like, like whatever, uh, sort of systems are operating in the soil right now. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that gets really exciting and fun. And this is something why I think the educational part of it's so important mm -hmm. because 
as soon as people find out that there are like slime molds that are the size of cities, no matter who you are, that is the coolest thing that has ever happened. Um, mm -hmm. We don't need aliens from outer space, although they're fun, but because we have city-sized slime molds, we have tree colonies that are like a thousand miles long. Yeah, it's, yeah. There's so much interesting stuff and the more, some of this is observational. Every time I've ever watched an insect pollinate, I'm fascinated. Mm -hmm. um, and it reminds me of all those little guys. And some of this is educational. I'm never gonna see that slime mold because what's to see, but they're it's still there. there. You can find them, they're in the woods. They're really cool. There's, I think I have one in my front yard right now, actually. Oh, you can show me, send else. me a picture. I'll identify for you. <laughs> yeah, because I don't know what else it could be. Yeah, I mean, like, your computer, like, take it outside. We're going on a field trip. Yeah, show me. Yeah, yeah, field trip. For those of you- thought I assumed it was a piece of melting plastic or something because Touch I have no vocabulary for it. Touch it and then you'll know. That's like a good give. What's for a touch like? If any, it, it's it's sl slimy. Yeah, it's just like <gasps> sweet. Okay, okay so I'm here's the weird it. thing. If some of you watching have not heard of slime molds or don't know about them, um, what's really cool about them is they're kind of this very bonkers organism. They're kind of like a fungus, but not really a fungus. And what's really bizarre about them kind of, I, I'm not an expert, but I do think they're very cool. There's all these different species. They're most like, visually, they're most like a fungus. They have like fruiting bodies that come up. But what's weird about them at the cellular level is they don't have cell walls at all. They're just a big bag of nuclei that sort of uh. around. So they sort of ooze around in this like, um, this organism and they can separate and rejoin. They can solve mazes, they can move towards food. They're weirdly, you can bring two pieces of the same species together and they'll join and like solve a maze. It's, there's like, if you get into slime mold, that's a whole different thing. But bring you back for a slime mold event. Equally amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we, we got a question actually, uh, and I, I, wanna, I wanna ask it prematurely because it, it dovetails so well with something that I was gonna uh, ask, which is that you know, I know from, from uh, uh, behind the curtain prepping, prepping with you two a bit for this conversation that both of you are, are, re are really well versed in, in naturalism, uh, both in contemporary times and, and in the past as well. And uh, Paul, uh, who wrote a question and asked uh, if, we, if we could talk about this work, uh, the story, uh, as it relates to other nature writing and to, to these traditions mm, of naturalism. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like we were getting towards naturalism anyway with our yeah, conversation yeah. and getting into other species yeah. and, and that right. the whole rich tapestry of plants and fungi and all that other stuff, so yeah. Uh, apart from the Perec, um, the attempt at exhausting a place in Paris, which is a kind of observational science that happens to be about a city. Um, uh, I was, one of the works that affects me the most, and I think affected the story the most, is Gilbert White's Natural History of Selburn, which is the one I was talking about earlier. So 18th century, he was a minister, he had a small church in the middle of nowhere, he was living about when Jane Austen was. Um, uh, in fact, he was doing his writing when she was a child, and she was born about seven miles from where he, he was working. And, he, he, so all he's writing about is the stuff basically in his garden, the stuff the local squire is noticing. Um, he's only writing about Selborne, this small town in England. And he does it for 50 years. So he writes again and again and again about the same things. And he comes back and says, oh yeah, the bean fields, here's a thing that's going on this year. And oh yeah, this is the first time I've seen the cuckoo this soon in the spring. And the, the fact he never got tired of this. He had this extensive correspondence. He was constantly speculating and constantly going out to see things. He'd say, oh yeah, I wanna see because that oak tree that was struck by lightning, that was three years ago. So interesting things are happening in the stump now. So I'm gonna go out and check this out. And that focus, um, which is not uh, pretentious at all. He doesn't think he's changing the world. He's just collecting this information because this is where he's planted and he's a curious kind of guy. Um, is, I think, just, just a marvelous piece of, of just reminding us of what happens if we slow down over periods instead of just saying, oh, I'm gonna spend two weeks in Yosemite. Oh my God, I'm gonna get it all. Or even, I'm gonna spend six months in Yosemite. I'm gonna get it all. It's like, or, or you could spend 20 years 
going down to the end of your street and looking at that vacant lot and watching it grow mm -hmm. up. Um, and that's really interesting. So, so Southern, uh, Gilbert White is one of them. There's some 19th century British writers who did the same thing. Richard Jeffries, who was writing, he was a journalist who wrote natural writing. He also was very interested in political causes. So some of his writing is about, you know, sort of workers' rights. So it gets really interesting sort of hybrid sometimes. Um, and then in the 20th century, my two favorite natural naturalist writers would be Annie Dillard, who did exactly what my story does, but did, did it for a little piece of wasteland somewhere in, I think, North Carolina, but she does it for like six months. Um, and then uh, Bernd Heinrich, who I also brought a visual aid. Love him. So good. Um, <laughs> he's such an accessible uh, writer and he's so um, he writes about all different kinds of things he did a book of, which is sort of like the natural history of long distance runners which is amazing oh I love that one why it's so you're good, on. right did um, you read, um sorry to to interject did you read his um the oh gosh what is it the um li uh, life everlasting the animal way of death that's no, very no. Very cool. That's all this kind of like basic foundational observational mm -hmm. school natural history science where yeah. he basically finds um, uh, like dead animals or he'll place dead animals outside of his cabin. He has this remote little cabin in, in rural Maine, I believe, and he <laughs> watch them every day and record the succession of insects and organisms that come to it and carry it away. And so he just writes about this, um, the whole... Um, that is so cool because that comes from when he wrote um, Ravens in Winter, which was, I think, mm -hmm. his first book, where he mm -hmm. did the exact same thing. He put yeah, moose yeah. out in front of his cabin, but then he was only interested in seeing when the ravens came and how and how they communicated. Mm -hmm. So this is like such a perfect example. It's like you start with one question or one thing you happen to notice, and all of a sudden you're like over in a completely different place, yeah. asking different questions that come from the same observations. Yeah. And Bernd Heinrich is one of those, it's almost a rare thing these days to be a, you know, a legitimate scientist who still does these natural history experiments because they're thought of as kind of passe um, almost. And I, I mean, I don't agree. I think it's very important. But um, what you're talking about now and what your story reminded me of too is just kind of this valuing, like, focus on and valuing of basic science, as they call it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the problem is with a lot of science that goes on these days is it's hard to get funded when you're, when you just want to spend 20 years observing your backyard, you know, <laughs> what's the point, right? And so, so uh, funders don't have trouble wanting to invest in that. It's more like basic versus applied science is the split, mm -hmm. right? So basic science is the thing that's asking, like, why is this important? Like, what question should I be asking? What can I learn broadly? You know, just a sketch. Mm -hmm. And that's the Bert Heinrich approach, right? Is this right. Like, yeah. I just watch my forest and see what happens for a number of weeks. It, years, and that's a, I, um, absolutely true. I think yeah. that um, the, the prior, and I think some of it's the fact that some stuff is quantifiable. And we're always talking, and fairly so, that science needs to be scientific experiments need to have reproducible results. Oh yes, um, reproducible, yeah. So that's certainly fundamental to the nature of the scientific method as practiced in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the challenges, and I forget who said this, but it was a nat naturalist said, the trouble is, is that all natural science is observational and that means it's all anecdotal. Um, everything I've ever seen an animal do is not quite like every other thing I've seen an animal do because it's never the same day, it's never the same animals. Everything has changed. I have a Jay outside making sounds. <laughs> but, um, but the, uh, uh, but that, uh, um, the accumulation of anecdote turns into statistics. And I think too, you, you can start somewhere with this kind of, an observation should be the basis of your questions that you're asking and your experiment and your manipulation. So mm -hmm. even you can do basic science that's based on an anecdote and you can still make it good solid science and reproducible and all of that, but still not have it be like on the path to curing cancer or yeah. solving climate change directly, right? Like maybe eventually something you find from that will lead to something which leads to something which leads to something. And yeah. we 
I get there and we don't know the answers or the questions to ask. Even. It, or it even is if it just inspires somebody, if, you know, somebody reading Gilbert White, who is not a great scientist, reads Gilbert White and then moves from that into becoming a scientist who does do something that changes the world. I mean, when we're kids and the first times we're introduced to this stuff, it's, you know, it's very, very few of us at the age of seven have decided that atomic uh, physics is the thing for us. It's not so, what, what happens is that we play in the mud and that we find a mud turtle and we think that's super cool. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually that mutates as we mature into other fields. Um, <laughs> I know, maybe not directly. I was like, I turtles are really cool. Pulling <laughs> turtles are super <laughs> cool too. But there are some people that it's, um, yeah. one thing we say in uh, science fiction, we argue all the time is that, um, We'll see when you talk to scientists, like when they would go to the NASA scientists and say, what got you started? When they talk to engineers and say, what got you started? They always say, well, I read this story when I was a kid. And I feel like science is kind of the same way that if we kept asking and said, okay, what got you started? It would turn out that they have, when they were little kids, they were doing citizen science, mm -hmm. you know, in their own imperfect way. They were, you know, going back every day to see if they could find that same turtle again. And then someday they sing and wondering again. We're yes. back. Yeah. 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 You know, it, it's, it's, it strikes me that the, you know, uh, one of the ways that space scientists and our space agencies like NASA uh, and the ESA have justified some of their uh, ex public expenditures over the past several decades has been that, you know, these uh, basic science missions, uh, in order to pull them off, they have to do all this technological development. You get tons of spin-off development. So there's arguments that microwaves and cell phones and other things are indirect oh, responses to space uh, exploration. Uh, the list is huge. I don't, I'm, I'm not very good at remembering things like that. But, um, you know, it, it strikes me that there's probably the same list for all of these natural uh, processes for basic science uh, in, in, in the field. Uh, uh, there's certainly knock-on things related to um, people exploring, for example, uh, rainforests, finding, yeah. you know, medicinal plants and things like this, right? But I, I feel like there's almost like there's not an organized institutional effort to make quite the same case as the space exploration community has made. And that's kind of, I don't know, just a, just an, an interesting parallel or lack of parallel there. Yeah. Um, one thing that, one example that I, that I can kind of think of that goes along with that um, of just basic science that turned into something more, but no one knew ahead of time. It was like um, people noticing that jellyfish could glow in the dark and being like, I wonder why jellyfish glow in the dark. You know, that's total basic science. But what they ended up finding was this protein, this like fluorescent protein, which now they can use to like mark cells and, and trace all kinds of things going on in the, the human body and um, map like neurological development and stuff. So right. it's like an accident, but I, I see what you're saying. But also make a glow in the dark cat. Um, and make it glow in the dark. Exactly. Oh, Axolotls, amazing. Yeah. Um, so we have we have a few audience questions, but I also want we you, you all were talking so close to something that I was hoping to ask you about that I, I'd like to pose it, which is you know as you were talking about all these naturalists, it seems like one common trait, at least amongst the ones that that you all like, um, are is this really um, devotional almost quality to to looking at these um, you know understudied landscapes or ignored landscapes or things that don't seem initially interesting or things that are just in our own backyard. Um, and it seems like there's almost a kind of um, spiritual element or uh, maybe devotional is more of a right word. Um, and perhaps that has to do with these, you know, intermingled webs of connectedness and embeddedness. Uh, but I, I do wonder how this kind of careful observation, if you all think, can it take us outside ourselves? Can it um, be meditative? Can it, you know, uh, and, and how does it connect to kind of uh, spiritual is, practice? I mean, this is Emerson, right? That's, that's yeah. all of them. That's Dillard. That's all of them making these connections. Um, one thing that I forgot to say that, or an author that I thought of before that I didn't mention was David George Haskell. Um, what's it called? The, the Forest Unseen. And so he does a very meditative practice in that book in which he goes to this one, he marks out this one square, I think like a meter in the forest by where he lives in Tennessee. And he goes out every single day for an entire year and he, he likens it to like a mandala. So it's like his meditation mm -hmm. practice. Every day he just goes out to this one square meter and stares at it and writes down everything that happens and writes this beautiful story. I think it, it is a Pulitzer nominated but didn't win or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just this connection of, of focus and meditation and getting outside yourself and seeing that connection that leads them to that, that kind of higher enlightenment. That's wonderful. 
Yeah. I, I know a photographer who, um, this was some years ago, but they had been taking photographs of all sorts of glamorous places. And then they spent a year where they, they walked the sheep field. And the only photos they took for that year were around the sheep field. Um, they stayed on the path. They did not stray of something interesting. And it was an attempt to refresh in their view. So um, to remind them, you know, it's like mountains are easy. Sheep, sheep fields are actually pretty easy too once you pay the same kind of mind to them mm -hmm. that you paid to the mountains. And to your question, Joey, it does, I, I always hesitate to say spiritual, um, but I but I do think that there something happens to your brain when you force it to slow down, when you yeah. force it to stop talking and start watching or listening. And um, the longer you can do it, the more interesting I think it gets. Witness the people who go in silent, you know, meditation retreats and things like that. So I, I wouldn't say that like Lena and her story is a more spiritually awakened person at the end than she was at the beginning but she has slowed way down. Um, she has started to notice, she's now no longer spending five seconds looking at the window. She's now spending two hours with the same window. And so she can look slower than she did before. And she notices things like that different roseate finch males have different patterns. Um, the red is, the flush is in different places on different birds, which you don't notice in five seconds. Right. So yeah, I mean, it, any opportunity we have to slow down and observe is good for us. And perhaps nature by, by its nature encourages a spirituality, um, you know, a sense of the profound otherness of the world and the fact we fit into it um, somehow and how. Um, that, that's a really important lesson for us to be reminded of. So uh, let's take a couple of the questions that came in from, uh, from the audience and then we can, uh, we can sort of see where we end up and see if we have a few extra minutes. But uh, before I ask any of my, of my closely held questions, but um, <laughs> I actually wanna start with a, with a comment um, from Mike. Um, so he uh, mentions that Australian Aborigines origin stories regard the individual components of their natural environment. So rocks, animals, trees, streams, rivers, as their ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so he points out this never, uh, makes them never feel alone in nature, right? That, that, that this makes that sense of community really literal. Uh, and he says, it, you know, he feels it's sad that we in the West have lost this connection. I wonder if y'all have a comment about uh, some of these other, again, getting to this issue of spirituality and belief systems around the natural world. Um, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this because um, uh, science fiction, one of the definitions of science fiction is that it's the literature of the species encountering change. Mm. That a good science fiction story has an implication for the species as, as a whole. And at some point, I, my dad was an engineer and then he became a minister. And at some point, I really interior, internalized that idea. And sometimes I think part of why I don't feel alone is because I do feel embedded in my species, um, that I am part of a species. And if I, if my, I'd never needed children because, because the species was gonna go on without me. But much more broadly, the planet as a whole goes on without me. And in fact, without us, I wrote a story three months ago that is about this exact thing, what, what is possible once, what, if humans are out of the picture. Um, I don't think we will be, but that's a different conversation. But, but thinking about that, it's like, we're not alone. Um, we're only alone insofar as we fail to recognize that we have these connections. Yeah. And provided we, we are aware of these connections, um, we're, we're never alone. We're part of our species. We're part of our environment. We're part of our, our community by Jesse's definition, of, you know, the natural community of my, you know, eight acres of like the neighborhood. And we're, so we're not alone. We just act like we're not alone because it's more convenient or, or because it's easier maybe. We can it's do more of the horrible things that we feel like we want to do sometimes. 
It's just we've become so separate in in the West, especially by having our, you know, climate controlled air conditioned homes and we can order everything on Amazon. And we're so we're never forced to get up close to nature in the way people used to be or other cultures still are. Right. And I I like the the example um, that you used because it was like it wasn't just the biological community that I mentioned. It was the abiotic things, too. Right. It was and it was the rock. The deck, even the deck develops this sort of resonance. Yeah. Because and that's like, yeah, the world that we're a part of that we don't see anymore because we think, we think we're think we isolated and we're not, and that's dangerous. Mm-hmm. That's when mm-hmm. it comes. Yeah, I think in the same way that this pandemic has made us, as we were talking about earlier, think about uh, all our supply chain workers and what we're now calling essential workers uh, who, who are easy to, I think, overlook, too easy to overlook. Um, uh, you know, the last story that we published in this series by Christopher Rowe, it's a great story for those of you who haven't read it, but it, uh, one of the things we talked about in the conversation that went with that story, uh, which is about agriculture and, and, and food growing and seeds and seed saving, uh, was about like the way that, um, you know, people, agricultural workers and people who, who grow food and are responsible for our food supply, they do know a fair amount about these natural systems, mm-hmm. um, even if the food system as a whole is... Uh, has some destructive impacts. Um, but the rest of us, I think, uh, have have sort of uh, been systematized, uh, you know, socialized away from away, away from those systems quite a bit and and incentivized to focus on other things. Um, so it, it becomes then then naturalism or gardening or whatever. They become hobbies instead of parts of our daily lives. They become very sandbox from the rest of our existence. Uh, and the story is about somebody who is kind of letting the rhythms of the natural world sort of back into her day-to-day existence, which certainly isn't one that's um, Luddite. You know, she, she's on a computer, she watches anime, you know, uh, she's, she texts people. Um, so you can, you know, you don't have to lose one to get the other, I don't think. Um, so we have a completely different kind of question, um, much more technical. Uh, so Steve uh, says he's an animal computer interaction academic working in computational anthrozoology. Uh, he's interested in autozoography and non-human narratology. By this, he means an account of a non-human's life written in the imagined voice of that individual. And That's he asks, my sweet spot. <laughs> is, that, is that something we can address authentically in science fiction without resorting to anthropomorphism, just making the non-human entities, uh, you know, speak in a human voice? That is exactly <laughs> where I live. That is the tension of my entire writing career is... Um, I'm always writing about non-human entities um, and writing from the point of view of non-human entities. And um, I, I mean, that is everything I write. And I find that um, the answer is no, we can't. Um, but the experiment is worthy. Um, we, we cannot, for instance, um, I spent 15 years uh, studying canid behaviorism. And what just to, uh, in, in the process, I wrote a book that used some of that, a novel that used some of that. And, my, and I picked dogs because I was like, they could, in many ways, behaviorally, we have more in common with dogs than we do with many of the apes. Um, and some of that, you, there were a lot of arguments about how humans and apes or how humans and dogs evolved together. There's a lot of really interesting research and a lot of really interesting speculation about this. So I said, if we can understand if I can understand anybody else's thoughts, it's going to be dogs. Um, turns out, no, all we can't <laughs> actually. Yeah. Um, and this was all part of sort of metaphorically speaking, the fact that it's almost impossible to understand what anybody else's experience is, period. I couldn't tell you what my brother's experiences are, even though he and I grew up together. I can only tell you what I observed of my brother and what I speculate were his experiences. So the short answer is no, I don't think you can. Um, I'm doing research right now for a story about crows um, and I'm experimenting right now with the idea that um, all of the information that crows convey to each other is actually a matrix of information, which it is for people. There are the words I'm speaking, there's a tone of voice, which is a different plane. There is the body language I'm giving you. There's the context in which we're having this conversation. The words I say are actually embedded in a matrix of of nonverbal communication, such that, um, uh, that when you separate it out and you just give the words, you've missed 80% of the information being conveyed. Um, Similarly, I'm assuming that with crows and dogs, 
we are missing an enormous, we're, we're missing the matrix in which even if they did use words, which they don't um, probably, and even if they did, we were able to translate them, which we won't be able to probably. Um, nevertheless, we would be missing the same kinds of layers of connotation, the layers of meeting. Um, my squirrels have just gone berserk out on the, the deck, which is right out there. So there was just warfare out there. But yeah, so my short answer is no, but that is the most interesting question in the world to me. And that is a question I ask pretty much every day of my life. So, so question. yeah, Jesse, I was going to ask when you're, when you're doing uh, re research on ecological systems or, or looking at, um, I don't know, animal communities or, or whatever, non-human communities, do you, do you encounter some of the same challenges around representation and how to write, how to write about their uh, behavior and, and things like yeah. that without, without resorting? Because so many nature documentaries that I've watched anyway, yeah. uh, totally just treat like whether it's a cheetah or, or a colony of apes as, you know, they use human behavioral metaphors oh, yeah. for almost everything. And I how think, do you avoid that or do you try to yeah. avoid it? No, it's absolutely a trap that you can fall into. Although it may not be a trap because if you're speaking of a documentary or even a story where your goal is to make the reader or the viewer care about it, right? Or to, to draw their empathy, the best thing you can do is to ascribe human emotions and to, to give things a human-like trajectory so that you can find empathy. But in the real world, I agree that it's, it's uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's probably impossible to completely avoid it because that's how our brains want to interpret everything around us. Like we want to ascribe meaning to the actions that we see. Um, and so in biology, in, in pure research, what you're trying to do is just kind of look at the cause and effect and, and try to isolate the behavior and say, oh, well, you know, my numbers, my statistics can show me that this is most likely for this reason. Um, the hardest part is creating sort of the story of why it's happening without kind of, yeah, when, when in reality every animal or every non-human entity you encounter is a complete alien species, like a complete alien thing that we can never truly deeply understand because their brains are so different and their brains mm -hmm. are so different and the way they communicate, as Kid was saying, is so different. Um, they have just of communication we don't have, pheromones and um, and scent plays such a, a larger role than they have an entire, often a, a whole different organ for, for picking up on chemical cues. It's called a vomeral nasal organ. Um, and so if you've ever seen like a horse or a cat doing that thing where their mouth is sort of open and they're just like kind of, it's, it's in the top of their mouth, it's in the roof of their mouth. So they're picking up chemical things from the air and they're getting a whole dimension of information that we're never gonna that we will never pick up on because ours is, is rudimentary. It's, it's gone basically, um, probably unfunctional, um, which is all to say that it's difficult to avoid. And the best you can do is, is try to maintain that kind of scientific objectivity and realize when the things you know is all you know. You know, the things you can, yeah. oh, this is all the evidence we have and here's my best guess for what it might mean. But we have to avoid trying to give human intentions to non-human. Yeah, or use it as metaphor because ultimately you're, I think Jess, you're absolutely right that part of why we build these sort of human, this human centric descriptions of behaviors that are not human mm -hmm. is that it's a way to, it's a metaphorical way to grasp it. It's a way to make a, make meaning out of it. And it's also a way to, to pass that information on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, because not everybody else will have read as much as I have about whatever it is or researched or not everybody is going to know what they need to for me to fully contextualize um, a moment of an interaction. Um, so if I want you to recognize what I just observed in a way, I kind of have to translate it into a human mm -hmm. definition. Um, I actually I don't describe that squirrel interaction completely differently. Yeah given 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and I honestly don't think, honestly, in a way, I don't think there's, depending on your goal, if your goal is pure scientific research, that's one thing. But mm -hmm. if your goal is to do, um, either to do science communication, to teach children about what's going on, to teach non-scientists about what's going on, to write a story about what's going on in, in the environment, maybe the best way to get the story across is to kind of put it in this, you know, this nice package of you can understand this when I make this connect right. with the way- you hybridize. Something, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
So that is kind of a tool of science communication too. Yeah, super interesting. That was a great question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so I, I want to ask, I, I want to shoot uh, mm, at least one more question uh, to you. Uh, this one's sort of addressed to you, Kitch, but, uh, and, and we'll do this quickly because we just have five minutes and still need to wrap up. But Peggy says um, uh, that she loved it when you said something happens to your brain when you force it to slow down. And I actually would love to hear what you both think about this. Uh, and, and she observes that right now we're being culturally sort of forced to slow down in some ways. And uh, what impacts do you anticipate from this? And remember, we don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> Um, the 30 second answer is um, that we're in a wonderful pause moment where what I would hope is that we would practice being still um, because as soon as this ends or as soon as things start to change, the, um, the entire culture and society we live in is predicated on us being fast. And all of those mechanisms are gonna spin back up, tr hoping to get us back up to the speed we used to be at. And I'm hoping that if enough of us try not to, we can counter it in some ways. I think it could be very effective and it could be a very good thing to force us to slow down. However, I've noticed with myself, um, although technically maybe I'm slowing down, I feel like I've been on screens and on the computer. <laughs> Right? And I don't know if other people have had the same experience, but that's doing something different. Like my brain's working differently when I'm staring at pixels than if I were just outside relaxing and staring in my backyard, right? So I think these are two very different environments that could shape us in different ways. And it all yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. I agree with you. Um, what, how work is defined is changing. Yeah. The fact that every single activity I have is about two feet from my face right now. Yeah. Um, I'm not in meetings 20 feet from people. I am in yeah. meetings two feet from people. The same keyboard that I use to write my fiction, to do my day job, to communicate with my best friends. It's all the same. And that, that's also very strange. So it's true. I think it's going to be quite complicated. Yeah. All right. So, so uh, with that, we're pretty much out of time. And uh, I want to thank you, Kidge and Jesse, for being with us today. And, and thank you, everybody who joined us. And thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, but it was, uh, they were great questions and, and I'm glad we were able to get at least some of them. Um, qu very quickly, Kidge and Jesse, could you each say, what's the best place uh, to find you and your work online? Where would you like to send people? I have a, um, a website, um, which is just www.kidgejohnson.com. Um, I put a lot of stuff, everything filters through there at some point. I also have Patreon and Facebook and a lot of my stories are just searchable um, through like any search engine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a website, jessierack.com. It's like rarely updated. More accurately, I'm on Instagram, um, millennial. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I actually have a, a series of science videos that I've been putting out for kids on YouTube. So you should be able to find it by my name. So great. Um, our, so our next Us in Flux story will be uh, titled When We Call a Place Home. And it's by Chinello Onwalu. Uh, yeah. We'll publish that this Thursday. Uh, the 23rd. And we'll have another one of these conversations next Monday, uh, April 27th with Chinello at the same time, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and you can find all of these Us in Flux stories and register for our events and watch videos of the old events uh, at csi.asu.edu slash us in flux. And thank you so much again to the two of you. And thank you so much to everyone for being here with us and supporting our work and being part of our community during this time. Thanks everyone have me. a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. yeah, thanks so much. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Be well. Thanks. Bye. Bye.